The title for the lesson is, God is the owner of everything. The Bible basis for this, Psalms 24, 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Or Colossians 1, 16 through 70, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, for the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. So the idea that God is the creator, the builder, and the sustainer. What role do we play if God owns everything in God's design, in God's system, in God's economy? What role do we play? Stewards. Thank you, stewards. Yes, that's a great word for agents, representatives, ambassadors, stewards, delegates, people who, who act in the best interest of the true owner. Adam, in Eden, was a steward of the planet Earth, given the whole planet to govern as Christ would govern. That was his responsibility. Adam and Eve together were equal and jointly were to govern this planet in love. That was the design. We are to live as God's friends and representatives today using the resources God has placed in our hands for the advancement of his kingdom. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. When Adam was created, he was brilliant. When, we're, when we are born, we are not. So look at the knowledge he had as a created being. He could name the animals. How did he learn, how did he learn that? How did he know that? I find that very interesting. So, so how did he name the animals? Uh, I think because he had capacity for reason and study and evaluation, and God brought the animals before him, and he evaluated them, their abilities, their different attributes, and, and he decided what name would fit them best based on the qualities, abilities, characteristics that they had. Uh, again, uh, God giving him that privilege, but he had abilities to be able to process all that. It also required he study and think. I don't, think he had a, I don't think he had a catalog already, uh, a, a lexicon already downloaded into his brain, and God said, uh, like we do to our kids, we pull out the little picture book and say, now what is that? Well, that's a cat. <laughs> he didn't have a lexicon in his brain. Uh, God wanted him to actually come up with a name for them. But he did have language already established. But he had language. That's right. Mm -hmm. But he also had brilliance, too. Brilliance, yeah. capacity for reason, study. Yes, and he loved to study the things of nature. So God owns everything. We're his agents. Now, the question is, and so in God's economy, God is the source of all. He distributes it out through his intelligent beings, whether that is life itself, love, truth, uh, compassion. All the good blessings come from God, and we receive that. It flows out to us as we carry out his purposes, and ultimately flows back to God in adoration and praise and never-ending circle of giving that life is built upon. Now, in the world today, are there competing economies or systems or philosophies that, uh, that, that compete with this idea that God is the owner of everything? Yes. The biblical idea, God owns it all, we're his stewards. That's the biblical model, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay? Is there competing ideas in the world? You're a little nothing if you're happy. What are the two big competing ideas? You actually alluded to one right there, and we're going to get to it. Two big competing ideas. Capitalism and Marxism. Those are the two big competing ideas. Uh, understand, neither one of these represents God's kingdom. Satan always tries to create conflict by setting up two uh, uh, false systems to substitute God's truth that people will choose one and fight over, and it doesn't matter which side they're on, they're still on his. This is one of them. The foundation of all human economics is the idea of ownership, of buying and selling. Nothing's free in this life. We must pay for it. And in this world, we are taught that safety and security is found in owning things. The more we own, the safer we feel. This is exactly the opposite of how God's economy works upon free giving. Matthew 10, 8, freely you have received, freely give. Or Proverbs 11, 24, and 25, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. The law of love, the law of giving that, is, that God's economy works upon. The Bible describes God's economy as this system of free giving, but in the world, the world is driven by 
fear and selfishness. This makes no sense. In the world, the more you give, the less you have. And therefore, if you give stuff away, you become poor. <coughs> and so you should hoard and you should take. The more you take, the more you store up, the more you have. It's the opposite of God's kingdom. Satan hates the kingdom of God and he hates people practicing it. And so he has these two competing systems, capitalism and socialism, also known as Marxism. Capitalism is a system in which people, individuals, can own property in this system of personal buying and selling. Its primary motivation is the accumulation of wealth. Businesses and business owners in a capitalist societies have as their number one priority returning income to their shareholders, making money for their business. That's their number one priority. The health and welfare of the populace is not number one. They will hurt people if they can get away with it to make money. Just look at Big Pharma in the last few years. Seriously, just look at that. It's very clear. And this is why without government regulation, capitalism always ends up hurting people. Polluting, exploiting child labor, all kinds of things. If it's just about wealth and making money, it becomes greed and self-driven and people become expend, expendable. For the, for, and, and what happens is society devolves into the super wealthy and everybody else who serves the super wealthy. So there's a competing one. And again, in the capitalistic, people can own. You can own. You're the owner. Marxism identifies the principle of ownership of property as evil. But it proposes a solution that creates greater corruption and more vile outcome than capitalism. The Marxist solution is that no one can own anything. All property is owned by the state. Marxism which is supposed to solve the problem of worldly selfishness and ownership by restricting property and ownership to the state, creates a system in which the state becomes supreme over everything, including the people. The state replaces God as the true owner, and people no longer answer to God as his stewards, but they answer to the state. And this inevitably results in a functional outcome that most people who support socialism are blind to, and that outcome, in all socialist societies, wherever it's been put into practice, the state becomes more valuable than the people, and the people functionally become no different than any other commodity owned by the state. And as long as you bring value to the state, the state will support you, but if you become a drain on the state, then you're expendable. And in every socialist society, the state ends up killing its people. <clears throat> Everywhere it's been put into place. Which is why Marxism and socialism is even a grosser perversion than capitalism. But again, the two systems are not gods, and Satan plays them off each other to cause society to divide and fragment. God's economy is the kingdom of love and free giving, the gospel of grace, the biblical metaphors of payment in the Bible are not economic or legal. They are actual what reality requires. If you had a child who was dying of renal failure and you freely gave a kidney to your child, we could say you paid a high price to save your child. It was not a legal price. It was not a financial price. It was the price that their condition required to save them. And so God paid an infinite price for our salvation, but it wasn't legal and it wasn't economic. It was actual. It was what was our, our, our condition required in order to remedy the sin condition. He knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. So see, conflicts in the world today are based on these two economic models. Do you see it? You see the two economic models battling in the world. <coughs> but can you recognize the intrusion of the socialist model when it doesn't use money? Yes. Mm -hmm. See, classic Marxism divided society, those who were wealthy and had property and wealth, and those who didn't. The workers from the owners. This is how classic Marxism divided society. 
along economic lines. And classic Marxism consistently failed to make any inroads into the West. Marxist philosophers really wondered about this. Why was it not making inroads into the West? And multiple scholarly Marxist philosophers finally realized the reason it was not making inroads into the West was because of Protestant Christianity. And what I just shared with you, in Protestant Christianity, God is the owner. And it is anathema to a committed Protestant Christian to consider the state is an owner and replacing God. And so as long as people have a, a belief and a love for God and recognize him as their true owner and we are stewards, we cannot actually align ourselves with systems that put the state in the place of God. And so Marxist philosophers realized that they could not make inroads into the West by advancing economic differences. So they came up with a new philosophy for these same principles called critical theory. And critical theory replaces economic differences with so-called power differences. Those in the power group and those out of the power group. And, and you're in the power group not based on your own personal power, but based on your identity in the group. And critical the traditional theories would seek to understand why certain things happen in societies and, and understand the reasons for those things. That's traditional study of, of anthropology and sociology and so forth. Simply understanding why things are the way they are. Critical theory is not simply seeking to understand, but actively seeking to, and this comes from one of the fathers of critical theory, seeking uh, in, uh, to understand society in order to criticize it ruthlessly to subvert, dismantle, disrupt, and overthrow the prevailing social order. That is the goal of critical theories. So who's the author, if you have it? Um, that's, uh, that's a Marxist named Horkheimer. Horkheimer. Okay? And he was quoting from Marx with that particular statement. <clears throat> critical theory shifts the focus away from actual economic power to oppressor and oppressed. Oppressors are the powerful, the oppressed are the disempowered. But it actually is not about personal power. Understand, the object of the uh, power, um, of individual power or powers is not relevant, the objective. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Oh, by the way, just to name some of the critical theories that are being taught in most of the universities around, around the United States now. Intersectional feminism, critical sexual studies, uh, post-colonial studies, indigenous studies, fat studies, and critical race theory. And in critical theory, it's taught that, those, that, taught that these and other identified oppressed groups must take power from the oppressors in order for there to be equity and fairness. But because the inequities are presumed to be inherent in the institutions built by the oppressors, the only way for there to be equity is to destroy the institutions built by the oppressors. For instance, in critical, let me show you, here's an instance. Uh, in critical sexual studies, the oppressed are the non-binary people, the LGBTQ and, and trans individuals. Um, they're, the, they're, the, they're the oppressed, and the, uh, the binary hit traditional um, Christian values of male-female relationships and a monogamous marriage, they're oppressors. So in critical theory... Uh, if you are a member, a, a person who actually believes in monogamous heterosexual marriage, you're automatically an oppressor. It doesn't matter if you march with LGBTQ people. It doesn't matter if you want equality. Equality in the, uh, in the critical sexual studies is not about equal right under the law to marry somebody of your choice. No, the, what, what they want is they actually want to destroy traditional Protestant values on male-female relationships, heterosexual marriage, what it means to be male and female. That, that, that is the goal of the critical studies because all of that is inherently oppressive. If you were to simply talk about the blessing God has given you in your 50-year marriage to your spouse, that is an aggressive statement against the LGBT people and it is oppressive. And it is part of the, um, the hierarchy of abuse that must be destroyed. So, Norway, uh, somebody was speaking out against this and actually got sentenced to prison for a hate speech. Yep. 
Yep. So, so speaking like I'm speaking right now in certain countries, you go to prison for it right now. So according to critical sexual studies, a gay actor or athlete, millionaire, with a private jet, $20 million home, chauffeur, personal chef, personal trainer, and exclusive access to the most elite elements of society is still oppressed, whereas a heterosexual single mother living in poverty on food stamps is an oppressor. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's exactly right. She's part of a system that oppresses because she identifies as heterosexual. The goal of the so-called equity uh, along gender lines is in, in the sexual um, critical uh, theory is to change the ideology of society regarding human sexuality, male and female, etc. The same philosophy uh, and methodology is being used in all critical studies, including critical race theory. In critical race theory, a nuclear family with a father and mother holding power over their children, appropriate godly power of discipline over their children, is deemed racist and whiteism as parents have pow uh, having power are oppressive and children are understood to be oppressed. So in critical race theory, the solution is for the children to be raised by the community or the state, which is exactly the philosophy of Marxism, by extension communism. This explains why, understanding this, you can now see what you're seeing in the news. It explains why in the United States today, wherever critical race theory is advanced, school officials believe it is their right and mandate to teach children various ideas such as gender fluidity that typically violates the values, morals, beliefs, and educational goals of the parents. These critical race theory school officials intentionally exclude parents because the, the philosophy views traditional two-parent homes as racist and part of the institutions of society that need to be subverted and overthrown. This explains why, in some districts, school officials advance gender-affirming care, hormone therapy, and even gender reassignment surgery on minors without parental involvement. Traditional parenting is, by critical race theory standards, racist in a form of whiteism, and therefore must be opposed. Understand what we're dealing with here. And if, as a parent, you oppose that, our attorney general will call you a domestic terrorist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, too. So what's actually being opposed here, and I want people to be very clear here, we are not in a race war in this country. Not race, no, ra it's, it's not a race war. This is a pretext. The focus is on race to, to gender up both anger in, in, in people who may be tr mistreated for their race, real stories of racism that occurs. There's no question. I'm not suggesting there's not such a thing as racism. But critical race theory is not actually about racism. We are not in a race war in this country. We're in a cultural war, and the goal of all the critical theories, and I've read, read a bunch of them, is the destruction of Protestant Christian values in this country. That, that is the goal. So this is a cultural war to destroy the belief in God. And understanding all the critical studies, all of the proponents of the critical studies come from godless evolutionary world, worldview. That's where they come from. And the reason they use things like race theory is because they want to, in people of goodwill, engender a simple sense, uh, 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 the, the emotion of empathy and compassion and sympathy, so that you will inadvertently support the very people, processes, and, and groups that are going to destroy the values that you hold. And if you don't support it, you'll be called a racist. And you don't want to be a bigot or a racist or a sexist, so that you will then support it. It's a big con job. The solution, of course, to all racism is Jesus Christ. When you love God, and we read in our text today, and love others as yourself, you treat everybody equal, equally. You love everybody. You love your brother. You love your neighbor. Okay? So this is not a political fight. I want you to understand this. It's not about politics. This is a culture war. It's a war for hearts and minds. Satan is activating his agencies on earth to infect people with a fraudulent value system. I know I'm not going to get through everything in my notes, so I'm going to try to get to some more critical, critical things. <laughs> So how do we distinguish between critical theory and critical thinking or critical discernment? I mean, some... There's yeah, so that's also how they use language. In the whole critical theories, they use language fraudulently. They, they take words and they will use them, uh, and you will think they mean one thing, they actually mean something else. 
Okay, they do not want. So critical reasoning typically means stepping back, looking at the pros, cons, uh, weighing things out, cause to effect, applying design laws or principles to them, see the outcomes, measure the outcomes, make intelligent decisions about what actually is best. That is not what it means. Critical theory means to criticize, not to critically reason. It means to criticize the, st the, the, the social norms, particularly coming out of, of Protestant Christianity. I read, it's in one of my blogs, you want to find this? Go to our website, and you can type in Smithsonian. Because I, I, in one of my blogs uh, about this, I uh, reproduce an entire document put out by the, um, uh, uh, the Smithsonian Institute on African American Studies. Uh, and this entire document defined what they termed whiteism in this country. And what they termed whiteism, which if you practice as racism, is a two-parent home, hard work, work eth ethic, scientific method, um, uh, and all, all of these things that actually are the principles of design law that God created humans to thrive and function upon. And if you practice those principles, then you're considered a racist. So a black African-American man who believes in uh, Jesus Christ, uh, believes in uh, heterosexual marriage, marries his wife, believes it's his responsibility to uh, pr work and provide for his family and stay faithful at home, uh, would be considered practicing whiteism. And he would not be considered authentically black. He, they're told they're acting white, and they're practicing whiteism, okay? This, this is this. So understand, it actually has nothing to do with, with your race. It has nothing to do with skin color. This whole thing is an attack on the principles of Protestant, Protestant Christianity. And the goal, I want you to understand, the goal is to break down the social order in this country, to break down the fabric of society so that people become, uh, life becomes less predictable, you become more fearful, there's more chaos in society, you have more crime, you have more exploitation, you have the defragmentation of families, you have more poverty, you have more hunger, and, and the goal of all that is to get people to say, we have no idea how to figure out what to do, it's all so confusing, it's all so overwhelming, somebody please come restore order and make us feel safe, we need our safe space, and then the dictators come in, the socialists come in, and you get your communist China, and you get your North Korea with somebody who will give a sense of a semblance of order, but through an authoritarian control, uh, your neighbor spying on neighbor, your secret police, you're ratting people out, dropping pe secret disappearances at night of anybody who questions, because independent, godly reasoning, thinking, and questioning must be destroyed. And this is the real goal behind all the critical th studies. Yeah. It's to destroy liberty, and, and, and by destroying liberty, it's to bring in principles that will face the image of God and man, and cause us to be mindless, thoughtless, and you see it's really taking hold in our society today. People are losing the capacity for reason, for discourse, for problem solving, for examining things, for coming to conclusions. It's amazing. I see it all over the place. They look for authority figures to tell them the answer. Sad. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm skipping all over the place here. So let me go into, let's go into uh, Wednesday's lesson. We have a, maybe a minute or two left.